Okay, so mass incarceration begins in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, this is what I was mentioning previously. Um, and as in the experience of reconstruction, um, essentially what we have uh, beginning in the late 1960s is the criminalization of people who were fighting for freedom. Uh, and this criminalization and incarceration of people who were involved in the black power and civil rights movement was the primary tool used by the state um, to reassert uh, political control. So in the 1960s, as you know, the late 1960s, there's a massive assault uh, across the world on the legitimacy of American empire. And U.S. hegemony is being challenged by the Vietnamese abroad, but also by the civil rights and black power movements. Um, and so mass incarceration of, of uh, black radicals primarily in um, the, the 60s, in the early 70s, gets extended to the majority of uh, the black and brown communities who are living in um, in urban centers uh, and who are experiencing in the 70s and 80s a massive intensification of deindustrialization. That is that jobs are leaving the cities to the suburbs and to the south and then abroad in stages. And there is permanent unemployment in the cities. So. Uh, the hyper incarceration of black and brown bodies um, is a way to deal with um, this crisis of unemployment, which is greater than it had ever been before. It's also important to note that incarceration in this period is a severe punishment that's leveled against the descendants of slaves uh, for daring to fight back and assert their place in American society. Um, again, uh, the mass expansion of prisons is happening alongside a problem of the state that it can no longer employ large numbers of people living in the city. And so the state um, essentially comes down hard on these communities that it's not able to absorb. And these uh, communities become dispensable um, in American society. And this dispensability of communities of color beginning in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when they are being mass incarcerated is now on fleek because part of what we're seeing is the willingness of the state to sacrifice the lives of thousands and thousands of people to essentially condemn them to, um, to the death penalty, because that is essentially what is happening in the prisons right now. I think it's important to note that of the 2.4 million people incarcerated, half of them were uh, unemployed at the time that they were arrested. Half of the 2.4 million people who are incarcerated today were unemployed at the time of their incarceration. And the rest had an annual income of approximately $10,000. Um, so what happens when the state is incapable of meeting the basic needs um, of so many of its citizens? It hammers them. Um, with the iron fist of the state. And we know that the war on drugs played a pivotal role in um, incarcerating so many people. I think I mentioned previously, I, I don't know if I did, that a third um, of the people who are incarcerated in American prisons today are incarcerated for non-victim, non, uh, for victimless crimes. Mm -hmm. So a third of the people who are incarcerated in the United States today are incarcerated for victimless crimes. Um, and I'll just end by saying that uh, imprisonment is the third largest employer in the United States. Um, 
uh, the first one I think is Walmart. So ironically, um, at a moment of mass deindustrialization that's hitting people of color in the cities, but also uh, white workers, um, imprisonment in the United States became um, a vehicle for um, for employing very poor community uh, com white communities in uh, rural areas and in small white towns um, who were also uh, these communities were also experiencing deindustrialization. It's a macabre situation that the country that dares call itself the land of the free mass incarcerates so many of its people, but also that it uses the apparatus of incarceration, one of the most repressive um, systems in society to produce jobs. It just gives you a sense of the depravity of the system. And in the context of a pandemic, that pre-existing cruel uh, system of class war that disproportionately affects uh, people of color is then willing to accept uh, what can only be called genocide. Uh, so this is the situation that uh, we are in today and the call has got to be to carcerate, release aging prisoners, release prisoners who are sick, release those who are immunocompromised, release at least a third of prisoners who are in there for uh, victimless uh, crimes. Thank you, Johanna, for laying that out. You really covered a lot. And I think one point I'd like to highlight is that you really brought together how the way in which mass incarceration is an economic, it fulfills a kind of economic function, right? Profiting off of prison, prisoners, providing jobs to depressed areas, but also really that its roots at root, it was a political a political strategy and a political tool, right, for repressing political radical movements, black power movements, and for shoring up a kind of shaky hege you know, hegemony coming out of the 60s and 70s. And I just want to point people towards the really incredible issue that Johanna edited of socialism and democracy, which we will post on our Shelter and Solidarity website, 